welcome to the Lap Monkey Music Show, too, by Ian McKay. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm just going to click off this thing telling me that it's recording is in progress. Yeah, so It is in uh, progress. All is well. Yeah, everything is good. I'm busy, as always, but that's my life. I have an all-time job. Well, you, you do, and that's one of the most important things. Um, people don't, obviously, people watching, they know who are you from, largely from Fugazi, uh, Discord Records, Minor Threat, the Evens. And I actually want to talk about your the newest album you just put out. Is, am I saying right? Is it Koriki? Koriki. 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 About, I just want to start with that. I love that album. Thanks. I mean, it, it has so many, it has like the best features of some of your stuff, and it has like Joe shines in it, like, and, and your wife shines in the drum. It's just, it just hits all the good spots. Kind you know? makes sense. Doesn't that make sense though? Since Joe and Amy and I are in the band together. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I get that. Somebody once said, point. somebody once said to me, "Oh, it's it's like the Evens and Fugazi mix." I'm like, uh, "Okay, yeah, I was in." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> pull that back a little bit, so I don't sound like a complete idiot, just a small idiot. Imagine all your bands are like meals, and it's like some of my favorites ingredients in the meals that work together. I just you. amped up into a small, like a taco. It's like all my favorites are together, like. Your voice and your guitar hits a certain point where in, in, in your playing is and, and Joe's bass is a little more out there. So it just works in a different way than the evens do. And I know it's the same thing, but I'm saying it just hits differently. That's all. I hear you. Yeah. That's Thanks. I, I, I take it. I take your words, your kind words as, you know, as uh, I take them seriously. And I'm not, I wasn't mostly, I don't, I don't mean to be a smart ass. It's just funny when people say <laughs> it's like, yeah. Joe and Amy and you are playing. Go, yeah, that's what we're doing. So it's all, you know, it's just funny to me. It's it's hard for me to, under, to think about music because I just, I make it. it. Yeah, just, and then I think, I'm glad that, what's interesting for me is like, like because I don't do any social media at all, and mm -hmm. because I think my, uh, having played music for so long and people's sort of perception of me over the years has sort of changed, um, I rarely hear from people about the work I do. Like no, like I write and I work so hard, especially on lyrics. I work so hard, at, and then there's almost zero, zero response to my words, like ever. Like I don't, and really? I just don't know. And it's and it's and it's weird for me because I always think, like, am I resonating with people, or is it is something happening? You know, I just don't know. Um, but I think it's because mostly I just have my head down. I'm just working, and then I start I think to so. think like. I just think like, well, I guess, you know, like with the even stuff and the curriculum stuff, you know, I, it's just, I, I started to wonder what well, should I, should I even work as hard as I do on my lyrics? Cause I just, cause yeah. it seem, people just like, Oh, great songs or whatever. <laughs> it's like, and I'm, and I'm trying really hard to like change the conversation in life. You know, I'm just trying to get people to think about things in different ways. Well, and I think that's what part of the thing I'm saying. I love, and I want to check the, the new album too. I think what was great is, and I wanted to actually talk about is your songwriting. I don't ever hear enough about, and your guitar playing in a way that you write songs, writing a good song and a simpler song that's good and doesn't sound simple is one of the hardest things ever. And one of the favorite things about what which you do in, in all the bands you're in is you create these pieces that aren't overly complicated in a way where it's like overwhelming. But each time you listen to it, you still are getting something fresh. Hmm. And I think that's a challenge as an artist. And I've, I've never been disappointed in, in any of your projects. And and the fact that this this album, to me, it's still fresh. As actually seems the lyrics are fantastic on this new album, actually. You know? Um, and I think they're quite current. That's why it's kind of funny. You're not in social media. You're not really involved. But you're just as relevant because, well, let's face it. The, the world is on fire right now. It's... The same situation, you know, you know what I'm saying, in the way they are with politics and it's getting goofier. I'm saying that the things that you were writing about earlier on and, and, and talking about your songs are still right here now, just as relevant. Yeah, I think that I actually think that the world, first of all, I think the world is not on fire, but I think that there's parts of the world that are on fire. Um, and I think that's always been the case forever and ever. If you were to pick up the newspaper from 1967 or something and read the headline, it was a nightmare, absolute nightmare was going on in 1967 or 1974 or 1983 or whatever. It's like the, it's a continuing crisis. Um, uh, and the moment, I think because of the delivery system of, of information, because everything is so immediate, it gives people a sense of it's an anxiety 
creating sort of medium. Um, people, especially people who really are subscribed, like they have like their they have their trumpets in their pockets, and the trumpet keeps blasting at them. Um, I think that it starts to make people feel like, oh, the world's coming to an end. I don't think the world's coming to an well, end. I don't think it's coming to an end. I just think it's on fire as in like, well, hold on. Uh, me, just like, hold oh, on. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, let, yeah, me, yeah. Let, me finish my, let me finish my point. Sorry. I'm not accusing you of thinking. Oh, that no, no, that'd be like, yeah. end. Um, my point is mostly that it's a continuing crisis that human beings, there's always been some human beings who have had the unfortunate capacity to do terrible things to each other um, or to the world. Most people do not. Um, and that's who I'm more interested in, frankly. Um, I, and, and when I say that, what I mean by that is I'm more interested in doing, thinking about like those people, because that gives me the kind of hope that I think is important to deal with the, these other these other problems. Um, so I think when I write songs, I try not to, to date them, um, mm -hmm. especially in Meyer Threat, for instance. If you, you know, in Meyer Threat song, I never once mention a politician's name. I think the only thing in Meyer Threat lyrics that kind that kind of date them is I think I use the term quaalude, which you know <laughs> nobody you know which is you know not Please. a drug that people think about now, but um, I talk about ludes and uh, but <laughs> by and large I just I really made it a point to not use terms or, or refer to people or things that would somehow suggest that I'm singing about what the song I'm singing about can only be applied in that particular setting where in fact um, music for me, I'm inspired by music that was written in the thirties that speaks to me about the condition of the world now, because it is a continuing issue of the world. It never stops. And so that's for me, the, what I think music should be inspiring um, from whatever age, because it's speaking the ultimate truth, which is that, you know, we should do well and be well. And that's my opinion. No, I agree with you. I'm sorry if I stepped over. I think what I was I got excited about was, I think, to me, to add to that was, I think, everything feels like a football game. I don't, I don't do sport. I'm not a sports person. But, like, it feels like everything's a sporting event, and everybody has teams, and every, everyone else, other team sucks. Like, it feels like human beings just stop listening. That's the right I mean on fire. Like, I feel like the human, the human emotions of people listening to each other seems to have shut down a lot more. And that's why music, to me, is still is healing mm -hmm. and it's cathartic. And I think, and you're right, all, all your songs that were then are relevant now. I love a lot of fun songs and fun rock songs because they give you every, every song can give you different emotions for different things. It's different for that. But what I love about yours is it's always a relevance and it's a, 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 a relatability, you know, it's, it's what's going on. You, you feel what's going on and it, it's not like out of the world and the musicality is good. And it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, um, I just current, but you, you, you challenge the songwriting in a way that you use, even you don't go crazy with guitars. I, mean, you're, I love your SG and then you use a baritone guitar. It depends on what you're using. You don't go crazy with different sounds, but you, you still seem to create songs without a million different effects, which is rare nowadays. I've never used pedals, so. Yeah, just that's not. fantastic. And Fugazi, I never, I just used a, an amp and a cable and a guitar. I always, it's, it's par partially because it's too overwhelming for me to think about. I just don't want to think, I don't, I'm sort of, I'm kind of anti-option in life. Yeah, I think options make us go crazy because we spend all of our time <laughs> trying to trying to decide. And I just figure we're made we we're made to work, and we have the tools we need, which are here and here and here and here and here and you know that's our tools. Um, and uh, so for me, when I start playing guitar, you know, if you give me if I if someone gives give me a guitar and I'm playing through an echo or something, I'll start writing. To the echo it's just right. a, whatever i just accept the context i'm in whatever whatever's at hand i'll work with it but when i see um i see most bands now people have a lot of effect pedals and stuff and i find actually i think to my ear and maybe it's just psychological um but the processing there's this very millisecond of a delay um hyper mega millisecond of delay on everything because it has to be treated and reproduced. Um, and there's something about that, which is akin to watching a movie that's slightly out of sync. Um, it really, it, it, it also, it makes me think that, you know, what we're hearing is not a guitar sound, 
but a representation of a guitar sound. And I'm interested in the vibrations of the guitar and the amplifier. That's what I'm interested in. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I've seen bands who like, for me, when I play in Fugazi, for instance, I use a lot of feedback and that was some that I was really, I love feedback and I enjoyed, but feedback was really contingent on the room. And every room you go into has different acoustics and certain tones would take off in certain different ways. If you had a wooden stage or a cement stage or a metal stage, whatever it is, the vibration, the way vibrations worked every night was different and every night was a challenge. Um, that's the way I like it. I don't want everything to be the same you know, I don't right. want that. As you probably know, Fugazi never used a set list ever. Yep. Like, again, the idea was to not have it be the same. The idea was to take the experience as it comes and then to be a part of that experience, not to control it, but to 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 surf it, to just ride that moment and and to trust that we have the the ability to do that. Uh, so I think with with instruments, um Partially because I just, I'm not of enough of an, um, I just don't have, I'm just not that interested. I'm not a gear person. Uh, I mean, part of it, people like, say, so you must love that SG. I do because it's my guitar. That's all. Like, I'm not, it's not that I love it because like it has some particular, right. it's just, that's the guitar I got. And, you know, and I got into SGs, I think probably because Pete Townsend played it, you know, mm -hmm. in Woodstock and, um, uh, and Charlie Watts in the cover of Get Your Yaya's Out, the live album, he's holding yeah. an SG and it's so narrow. And I'm like, that's so cool. You know, I don't know. Who knows? As a kid, something about the shape of that guitar appealed to me. So then when when my boss at the record store yesterday and today, this guy Skip Groff, he's like, hey, do you want to buy a guitar? And I was like, yes. And it was an SG. And I was like, yes, I want that guitar. And that was the brown one. Um, just because I like the shape of it. Uh, but I, for no other reason, I don't know if it's any better or worse. All I know is that I know how to use it. Yeah, I I love SGs. I'm not a super geek, and uh, I think it's a rabbit hole. I get overwhelmed myself. But I do like to appreciate musician writes whatever they write with this guitar, or whatever. And these sounds or effects are part of the paintbrushes. I thought the SG was great because I just like I thought uh, a big Frank Zappa fan. I love that guitar. Mm -hmm. I thought it looked cool. I had talked to Dwayne. I talked to Dweezil. Dweezil's like when he first saw it, he thought it was cool because it looked like Batman to him. The, oh, the points on it. <laughs> so everyone has a reason why they like something. It's just kind yeah. of different, you know. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So it's, and I don't. I mean, there is there are definitely um, visual markers in instruments. You know, like when you yeah. see a band and somebody comes out with a, I don't know, a BC Rich or something, you get that gives you a sense of where they're coming from. I mean, right. you you there are visual identifiers that are they're real because that's the way we're we've we're trained or we've trained ourselves. Um, I tend to just try to be as um, less flashy as possible because <laughs> I just want, I don't, I'm not interested in appearances, honestly. I'm just interested in the work. That's what I'm interested in. What, what made you choose, when you, obviously you switched from Fugazi to the events, what made you choose for the baritone guitar though? Like what was the, because you're not so flashy. I mean, I, I know you're very bare minimum. What made that decision? There's no bass in the band. There's a two piece, and just, I, felt, okay. I felt like I needed more low end. I'm, I'm, I'm. I think I'm really a bass player. Honestly, I played, <laughs> I played bass in the Teen Idols, and then I moved to guitar and Fugazi. But if you listen, I mean, I wrote a lot. I wrote quite a few of the bass lines in that band. Um, but also, I'm a rhythm guitar player, and I a lot of times Joe and I would be essentially playing the same thing. I mean, he's a master bass player. Um, yeah. And so just playing with him, he and I would just lock in together um, playing. And and Guy was sort of the more of the kind of fireworks kind of guy usually um, with his guitar stuff. So I think that I come, I'm very rhythmic and I come at, I come at the instrument as, um, yeah, I just, I just hear shape, the shapes. I, I can't, I don't know. I can't even explain it. It's just what I, how I play. And so when I, when Amy and I started playing, initially I played guitar, I had a, I had this weird other SG that I had put flat wound strings on and it was a really bassy instrument. It had just a lot of low end on it. 
And I thought it sounded kind of cool. It was a weird flat wound guitar string. They're super weird. I thought this would be interesting to fool with, see if as a tool what would have what I could come up with. It was it was interesting. It was limiting. Um and I just missed low end. So then I actually had a baritone guitar, which I I'd been at a store about maybe six years before that. And this just a local store, and they had this uh Dan Electro, it was a reissue. They were putting out the baritone. And the guy said, oh, you might find this interesting. It's like a baritone guitar. And I'd, I'd never even heard of it. I'd heard of a six-string bass, but that's not a baritone guitar, you know, a baritone right, guitar. No. So that I just started, so I sat down with it and I was playing it and I thought, this is cool. This is probably 96 or 97. Um, and it was, I think and it was like 300 bucks. I was like, I'll buy it. You know, fuck, I'll buy it. And I bought it and then brought it back home the guy told me he says you know it was actually designed for surf music but then a lot of surf surf people had it just was not a great guitar it didn't work for a lot of stuff and he said that it most famously was used in the um uh spaghetti western soundtracks mm -hmm. you know like the um what's it's leon sergio leon is that the name of the guy the the I think so, yeah, yeah. Anyway. I know what you're talking about. I know the sign is right. You're talking about. Yeah, bow, down, down, down. And I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." So then I brought the guitar to a Fugazi practice and tried to play through the Marshall, and that was ridiculous. <laughs> it didn't sound any good at all. Um, so I just sat in my front room here at Discord House, and every once in a while I'd fool around with it, play. I liked it unplugged. It sounded. I like Dan Electro's unplugged. They're nice. Those mm -hmm. kind of. Um, they have hollow bodies, so they resonate, and I just like the way it feels. Um, and so anyway, Amy and I were playing, and then I thought, oh, may I try the 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 Dan Electro and just not distort it? And it sounded great. And I then I could play, I did a lot of stuff where I'm actually playing a bass line with my thumb and using my other, you know, the fingers to play other bits. And it was interesting, you know, I got a I liked it. It was interesting. But then when we started playing with Joe, when he came back from Italy and we started playing together, originally I was playing the baritone. And at one point, Joe said, you know, I have the low end covered. <laughs> so I said, okay, so I got the SG back out. And that was so curriculum, I play SG. You guys, so you, and people that don't know, the band started, what, is it 2015, I think I read? You can't trust the internet. Yeah, Around we that started time. playing, no, that's about right. We, we, Joe, before he moved to Italy, or maybe at some point in the earlier, we played together, the three of us. I mean, he had done stuff with Amy in the past. and yeah. And you know, we have all known each other forever. So then he's living in Italy um, for about eight years and he came back in around 2015. So we just started to play together, but I've never been in any hurry. I always, I'm just not in a hurry. So I, so, you know, I don't know if you know the beginning of Fugazi. When I first, you know, started talking to Joe about playing music, I said to him, do you want to play music with me? I'm not forming a band. I just want to play music. And he said, yes. And then we asked if this guy, Colin Sears, who was a drummer for his band, Dag Nasty, and they had broken up. So I ran to Colin. And I said, hey, Joe and I are playing music. Do you want to play music with us? We're not forming a band. And he goes, sure. So then we just played music. We just practiced and practiced. And whenever we could, we practiced. And then at some point, Colin, Dag Nasty reformed and Colin left. And so then Brendan was practicing here at the house at Discord. So I said, hey. Joe and I have been playing music with Colin. Do you want to play music with us? We're not forming a band. And he said, sure. So then we played with Brendan for six months. So this is now almost a year. We've just been playing in the basement and loving it, just playing and playing and playing. Um, eventually, it was like, maybe we should do a show and be a band. But it but for me, I just, just want to play. So when Joe came back from Italy and Amy and I were playing together all the time anyway, we never stopped playing, even though the Evens hadn't done any gigs we continued to practice and work on ideas we play with other people and when joe came back we started playing with him and uh it was just nice and at some point we thought oh maybe we should play a show and uh i think we did a couple shows in 2019 um that were cool and then we did about eight or nine shows in the end of 2019 into 2020 and then pandemic and that was that for you know we haven't played since but but the point being that we just started we just played together. We just, I have so many recordings of us practicing and working on ideas. Um, it's a little too, honestly, it's a little 
too glacial because I can't finish writing songs and that's a problem. Like it just takes forever because there's no pressure <laughs> to finish a song. You know, historically, it's like you got to get the song done so you can go on tour. You got to get the song done. Right. I don't have that. So, um, and also I'm kind of, I'm at a point in my life at the moment where I'm like, all right, I got to relearn. I got to read, I got to teach myself how to write a song again. Well, I think the songs are great. And that's why I was wondering if there'd be more because this band, I'd like to see more albums come from this band sooner than five, every five, 10 years, you know? Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, at the moment I'm, I'm, you know, we're taking a break um, because I really hit a wall. I just say, I can't write a song right now. So that's all right. Again, I'm, I'm in no hurry. So whatever, when it's time, it'll be time. And we did write a few more songs during the pandemic and we, I don't know, you know, we did some recording. I don't know what will ever happen with those things. Um, I think it was unusual. It was a bad, it was a, the timing was weird. Cause we really did had done eight or nine shows and they were great. And then we got, you know, the, our last show, like in the beginning of March of 2020 and then bop, you know, we got, everything got shut down. Our record came out that summer, but you know, it's like to a vacuum, right? Because you can't go play the show. You right. don't really have any sense of it. Um, and then, you know, such a long, such a long period of time that, you know, we never, so we never did a show after that. And, um, and then last August, a year ago, I just thought, Oh, I can't, I'm, I need to take a break. I'm, I need to, I really do. I'm not kidding around. I need, there's time to my life where I think I need to, I need to stop playing music. I got to remember how to write a song, you know, I can do it. It just need I need to get my brain into that sh yeah. that form, you know. And I'm I'm getting there. I've been playing by myself. I'm getting there. And and when I write some songs, then maybe we'll get back to practicing. I just need to finish some shit. I have too many unfinished things. I have thrown away more riffs. I've forgotten more riffs than I've written, and it drives me nuts because there's some good riffs in there that I just forget about. Record them. Got at least something, right? I do this sometimes, but sometimes I just forget to do that. And then it comes... <laughs> well, in the beginning, though, where you where you wrote, you did a lot of writing, and then at one point, like in Fugazi, like there's more collaboration, right? So then it, did it kind of change again, where you were doing more writing again, like with the Evens, and and then this band, like it was just it shifted. Yeah. Was it better to have some collaboration? Did it kind of push you a little bit more? They're different, you know, just different things. I mean, in the beginning of Fugazi, I was writing pretty much everything. Joe right. was also kicking bass lines, but. I was, you know, I was doing all the singing in the very beginning. Um, so then I would come in and say, and also, you know, Brendan was new and I just say, oh, here's a song. And I'd come in with a song. And then, so at the beginning of the band, I would say, here's another song. Well, here's another song. I'd write the verses and the choruses and I have the whole thing arranged with the words and everything. Um, but at some point they're like, hey, you know, we, you know, we'd like to be a part of this process. And we're like, oh, yeah. that hadn't occurred to, you know, I wasn't trying to be, uh, I wasn't trying to be the boss of everybody. I literally just, just my way. So I said, oh, and what, one of the things is that when you write, when you like, I would bring in sort of finished songs and then they would take the songs apart, you know, because yeah, they want to be a part of the process. And I, I told somebody it would be a little bit like if you rode a bicycle to practice and then the bicycle would wheel into the room and they, the people, other people in the band take the bike down to its nuts and bolts. And then they move some parts around or they take some parts out and they put it back together you can't ride it anymore you know that's what it felt like to me it didn't work and so <laughs> it was too painful so i realized oh don't bring in finished songs bring in ideas and then grow them with other people and that was so amazing i mean fugazi like the time we spent working on music together I mean, we, it was, yeah, obviously it, it was hard sometimes but really that for me, it was so rich that that experience. Of just because Brendan and Guy and Joe, are, they're all brilliant musicians, and they're super, we're all super funny, and and we have such a great like vernacular between the four of yeah. us. Um, and it's so exciting when you you know you're pushing something, all these sounds together, and they end up being something. It's such a nice feeling. Uh, the Evens, Amy is an absolutely brilliant musician as well. Um, but she's she's a drummer and she and while she's very she's very musical um the her work she's she doesn't have a lot of she's not coming with riffs for instance you, right. know, she's oh, yeah. just, you know and um and joe i think joe had some but he's 
I think Joe kind of felt like this is sort of your guys thing. I'm just going to kind of like, I'll, you give me some stuff to work with and I'll bring in my ideas. I don't know. It just was not, um, it's been hard because I also, I've written a lot of songs and I also, um, uh, as you get, you know, as one gets older, one sees the world more and more increasingly more nuanced. So it's the, the broad stroke is, 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 um, harder to achieve, you know, you know, that's why when you said earlier, the world's on fire, I'm like, well, actually, you know, that's just me. That's the way my brain works. Well, no. And, and I think, yeah, I get that. I think yeah. right now I, everyone's like, Oh, what a shit show the world is. Or like, you know, everything's going to hell. And then, I just don't think that's a productive way of thinking. I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying to the world. Yeah. I think, I actually think that the world is, is, is a, an incredibly beautiful place and we need to work hard to try to stop people who are doing terrible things. That's what I think. I agree. And I think, and, 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 and what I think is, I always felt, I'm super optimistic about everything. I think at least with the internet and we're learning that people in this country also aren't the same as their government. We're all kind of the same. It's more the governments, you know, and I get that. It's just like lately the people I know in the day-to-day -day world are so much worse to other people. And I'm like, where is this coming from? This is the <laughs> my favorite part of, the, of being human is, the human is the, 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 the connection. It feels like people that just feels like it's evaporated a little bit with COVID or something that happened where it is a twist. And that to me is where it feels like the world's on fire to me, because that was my favorite part of the world is the connection well, of I guess, the day to day uh, humans. And a sort of a meta form though, to me, right. Saying the world's on fire is that is the same. That's the same. Like if everyone's, yeah. that's the point. That's exactly right. Like everyone feels like everything's so fucked up or everyone's not being nice to each other or whatever. Then it just, then, then you're, it's almost like you're cementing or you're like, you're shellacking the, the, the picture. You're, you're, you're freezing the image. Whereas I actually think, again, I do think, you know, I've said this for years that, you know, we, this society has been stoned on technology and, um, and I think that's still the case. It's getting to be less the case. I think people are starting to recognize that, they're these devices are tools and they're not um, religions, but um, it's going to take a little, little while longer, but it has affected deeply the way people interact. Um, obviously the pandemic was uh, a supercharger in that, that, that arena, like in terms of people, everything being like this, talking through yeah. a screen or whatever. Um, and, you know, you know, the thing about text as a form period is it, you know, text. Reader, Reader supplies the tone, you know, whether it's email or text, but especially with text, reader supplies the tone. So if you write, you know, if you said, um, if you wrote me and said, hey, you know, you know, hey, you know, the interview starting in five minutes, I wrote back and I write back, I'm aware. Um, right. You might think I'm like, OK, I know I'm aware or you don't call me an idiot or, or you might. Or, right. but maybe I was like, I'm aware. <laughs> who knows reader supplies the tone and that's it's a problem you know i do most of my work you know most of my business on the phone just because i can at least hear the tone also yes. it's much quicker just get the shit done um but getting people on the phone is that's a challenge uh <laughs> but i do i do think that I, I think that we've been deeply affected as, as human beings have been deeply affected at least in our society by the technology and that probably has led to people having a harder or more, it's been more difficult for people to, to interrelate to the, there's probably been some effect of that. Certainly if you sit on a bus or any other mode of transportation, um, you know, you'd be hard pressed to count, you know, the number of people who are on their devices. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's weird to me, you know, cause I don't even have a smartphone. So I'm always just sort of in the, I just like this, look at the, out the window or look at people, but it's all right. I'm not mad at them. It's just a different, it's just, it just shows they're engaging in something very private or something. Um, but they're not in the room with me. And uh, that's just, what, but that could affect maybe our, our inner relation, our relationships, you know, <laughs> perhaps. To me, the, well, yeah, to me, the exciting part of having a cell phone was I could put my music on it. And I'd have to wear a Walkman, go through eight batteries a day. And I had a phone on me. So to me, I'm always listening to music. That's my big connection. I get you know, it. Try, and I try being self-aware of not being looking in the phone because when I see people doing that, it reminds me to not be that person because I don't right. want to be that person, not be, not judging them, but I don't want to be not focusing on the world. So I try to keep yeah, encouraging I, myself. 
to be clear, I'm not a Luddite oh, and no. I'm not like I'm talking to you on a device. And this is, yeah. a, you know, I'm on a, a laptop and <clears throat> this is a fucking miracle. Where are you right now? I'm in Where Connecticut. Live? Okay. All right. So I'm, you know, what, what, what town? Harford. All right. So you're in Hartford. So you're approximately a, <clears throat> eight hours on, you know, drive from yeah. Washington, D.C. And, yeah. um, but we're having a conversation in real time. Uh, it's a miracle. So I'm not, you know, I get it. It's like, I, and I've, you know, it's, I'm not a Luddite. Uh, you know, I think that my decision about the device that I carry, that I have a flip phone, is really one of self preservation because um, I would find the constant, like this, the con being constantly connected at some point just starts to make me feel insane. Like I just don't want to get there. Now that's just about me. I'm not other people. That's their business, and I'm not mad at nobody about it. But when you talk about the way inter people interact with each other, I'm just suggesting that probably there's some role that, and I think that humans will figure out how to make how to work weave that back in. Ultimately, we are together. You know, that's my sense. Um, but I'm, you know. I'm a generally an optimistic guy, so that's the way I am. Well, I was excited over the use of Zoom, like for us and and, and over over the over COVID. I've talked to people in Brazil and all different countries, and we're all getting on. And I'm like, this is a, this is the good part of technology. This is a communication tool that people that aren't in government or celebrities are flying on jets. That anybody can open up a, any kind of device, pretty much, and talk about how they feel and share, yeah. like I said, in real time. And that's fantastic, and that's that's a good thing for humanity. Now. Okay. Too much of a good thing to be bad, you know. <laughs> but to that point, I do think th that was that was my concern on that part. Or to me, that was my favorite part of being human. That's why that's why it feels bad. I think the world's fine. I do think that, yeah. I mean, it's always been weird like this, but I hope humans turn like like you said back to back to being you know more 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 uh, kindness. I mean, I miss kindness. I just yeah. feel like that was my favorite thing, you know. Be kind. Yeah. Go on. Uh, go, you should go in the world and be kind. It's 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 a great thing. Yeah, get out of your house. Go be kind. That's that's my that's my that's that would be the first step. I mean, years ago, I will say this: that years and years ago, a friend of mine said to me, "This is when I was in my threat." Maybe she said, "Oh, it's funny. All your songs have like the word no or don't or not, you know." Or these, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it, you know." And so over the years, I kind of I meditated on that. I thought no, not meditated, but I thought no, about I it. Sense. Um, but I thought about this, the conversation, and at some point in the eight, mid 80s, maybe even the late 80s, I remember thinking, like, you know, all this, like, these angry songs and this, like, this sort of protest and all that stuff. And I, I said, like, what, what is it that we're fighting for? Like, what is it, what are we trying to achieve? Like, with all this, like, if we're frustrated, if we're angry, what is it that would be? What what's the answer? What's good? What would be? What are we trying to? Yeah. What do what do we hope to bring about with all this work? And my best guess, in its sort of generalities, would be happiness and peace and justice, fairness, um, action on peace. Um, you know, like that. That to me it seems like that's the idea. That's what we're we're fomenting for um and i thought about people i knew who were especially in the political world who are really angry and just so like just furious and, and convinced that the government's this that and but you know whatever and i don't know about you but people i know who are like that they're like I, you're like you can only take so much of it yeah. you know because it's unending and i knew people who are in singing and bands who are sort of political and they're just perpetually furious and scared and convinced that some bullshit was happening and this conspiracy and that conspiracy and all the stuff that was going on. And I thought, I don't want to hang out with those people like that. Doesn't they're not welcoming because they, they don't trust anybody, you know, it makes. And then I thought, well, what, what kind of people do you want to hang out with? And I thought like people who are kind and, you know, want to share and, trust trust you i thought that's that's the person that's where i want that's the community i want to be a part of that's the community i'm trying to create wow, that's, that's a great so, one. right so that's how i decided i was going to fucking live just to be kind and to be trusting and to 
not jump for the jump at the conclusion that everything was terrible or to jump to a you know that to be really like you, I don't do a lot of bad mouthing his stuff, yeah. right? And 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 you know I try to be, I do th- I do stress that that one can be critical of society without taking ju- not without being judgmental on on individuals. Right. I think that's a really important distinction. Um, so when I talk about smartphones, I'm not. This is not a judgment of any one person. It's really about a societal situation, and I think that that's legitimate, and I think it should be thought about. But it doesn't mean. But I'm not going to be fixated on it. I don't. At the end of the day, here's the thing. Do you remember song, Fugazi had a song called "Song Number One"? Do you know that song? Yeah. Right. Do you remember the chorus of the song? It's nothing. And that's, I genuinely believe, like, yeah, it's all fucking nothing. This is all a bunch of nonsense. You know, really, when you get down to it, all, you know, all the shit behind me, all the shit behind you, all the, all yeah. the, all the all, it's all, it's, it's all, if right now, like a, a meteor could land on Discord House and wipe out everything that I've ever been involved with, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect a hair on a camel's back and another no one cares. It doesn't matter. It yeah. completely doesn't matter. Um, so with that in mind, knowing that it, everything is ephemeral, then I think do well, be well. Why not? Well, I, well, I started the show. It was about that. Just being happy. Like I never, we don't, I don't ever talk about anything negative. I don't talk about, just don't need to. Everyone's got their opinions. They, I don't, they don't need mine. I don't need to share my thoughts or negativity. It's about giving somebody a couple of minutes of happiness. It's about laughing. I love to laugh. I mean, there is negativity. Let's laugh about it. Let's let's move on. And I think at one point a few years ago, I learned, and I, and I think that's one of the things that always resonated with me. I think I felt with your music. It's not about the ending. And I realized, I'm like, why am I never happy? I always achieve something. And I feel like I was next. I forgot to enjoy the journey. I think I, I look back, I'm like, I was happiness getting to that point, like trying to work and learn and create as the journey goes. It's like almost the better part, like being a part of the movement. And not the end, which is like the reward of whether it be cash or a house or a job. It's like it's looking back to how you got there, you know, or just is, not looking back, just just doing well. For my for, for my for my for my thought, yeah, process, yeah. when I first realized, yeah, it, I was like, wait a minute, what, what, yeah. I was actually kind of happier getting to that point. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, I'm not a goal oriented person. I'm not especially been... more now. I'm just trying to be happy every day. Yeah. Right, you know, you did say something once that I thought was very, very, very. I mean, maybe it wouldn't be so heavy, but maybe it did. And you presented it, and it was and helped me change my my vision of being so stressed out over the government and like Democrats or Republicans and different parties. And you said, you said, look, this is the government is a business, right? And I went, oh, like it's there. I get it. Yeah. And then I started thinking about how people play it and move it. I'm like, it's not this and this. It's just this. Right, and people aren't aware. I don't know if it's actually you've said it different places. I forgot I saw it. There's a lot of great lectures and, and talking pieces you've done on YouTube, which I've really enjoyed, and people can really get into. I'm just kind of having a conversation with you, and I really enjoyed the talk. I really enjoyed what you're talking about because it, it really just kind of gave me a different perspective about, about just the government in a way, you know. And right. I think it made me feel less stressed. Having grown up in Washington D.C., you know, I've been here my entire life. I'm 61 now, and. uh it's so obvious to me that the government is just a giant factory in the middle of town. You know, you're in Hartford insurance is your, your jam, right? Like, in, <laughs> right. That's what I, do. Yeah. I do. I do IT for insurance. So, yeah. Right. So, right. So, so that's the big, that's the business in town. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm from what I'm a Washingtonian. I'm not, I'm not a federal, I don't, my parents didn't work for the federal government. I'm not involved in that world at all, really. Um, but it's all there. And once you recognize, I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's yeah, it's a business. They're looking after themselves and they that's their bottom line. Everybody in that world is they may have they may have stated intention, but as a bulk, they're 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 just keeping their jobs. That's what they're doing. Um I guarantee you that if for instance, if they shut down the government and all of their their salaries and their um their salaries and their amenities were cut off with that they would be shutting the fucking government down right that's yeah. they would never let it happen but they that's how they've got it set up it's always about them and uh there was a great i saw years ago i saw a documentary about it was during the invasion of iraq in the early 2000s and it was there in um 
maybe in Fallujah or something like that, one of the, you know, one of those towns where they had horrible, horrible fights. And it was a it was a bunch of um, it was a lecture being given. It was like it was like a meeting with a bunch of the lieutenants and sergeants of some you know the army or whatever. And some commander person came in. He was sort of having a I don't know what do you call it? like a little they're having a meeting and he's talking yeah. about he comes in to talk to all these guys and and you know these these other leaders and he said before i start he goes let me just ask you all like what's our mission here and the room is sort of stunned silently right like they're like and everyone's like uh and then some guy puts his hand up and he says to spread democracy and the guy just laughs. He goes, "Oh, he laughs." And he goes, "Come on, come on, come on. Let's let's move away. What really? What's our mission? What's our mission here?" And then someone else said, "To uh, stop the the Revolutionary Guards attack on." And he goes, "Oh, come on. We're not. That's not why we're here. What what is our mission?" And he kept asking. No one could give him the answer. And finally, he said, "No." He goes, "Our mission is to protect ourselves." that's what they're doing and when you think about it like that you think about the government like their mission is to protect themselves and that means they always look after themselves their money and all that so once you realize that that's the same with your business not your business but the insurance business the same thing it's about making money and looking after themselves and they'll provide a service as long as it generates the money that will you know take care of the things they need um but uh end of the day their mission is to protect themselves. And when you think about the government like that, it really puts it into a frame that makes it much more manageable. Because if you if you get it confused, sometimes I think people confuse government with religion. Although ironically, religion is also a business, but- um, Biggest but, business. You know, yeah, pa you know, patriotism has this sort of, you know, sort of religious overtone to it. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think that, you know, that those structures, um, they've done- Religion and government have done many wonderful things for people, um, and they're also responsible for almost all of the horrible things. When you think about it, yeah, I was talking I totally the other day about it. religion. I, I talked about. I was talking to a cleric the other day, and we talked about religion. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm an atheist. I'm just not a subscriber. Whatever the fuck, I don't. I just don't. It's not, I just, my life is. It's not. I don't need. I don't. It's not my thing. But anyway, we were talking about religion, and I said, you know, the thing about religion for me is that it's like so much incredible stuff came out of it. Obviously the civil rights movement and, the, and all these different progressive movements of religion had a huge role, important role, deeply important role. But then, but then on the other hand, like you think about almost all of the major conflicts, the bloodletting in the world and somewhere in there, if not at the fucking front, there's religion. Like what's happening right now, in a number of different places, there's a religion right and squarely in the middle of it. And that is not about God, if you ask me. No, I agree. It's about power. And, and they're using religion for power. But um, so, again, think about it like a business. And then that helps us figure out what the, what's really going on. It, it did put things in perspective. Um, I'm keeping mindful of your time. I have a couple minutes left. I just want to ask a couple quick questions that I ask you. Was always interesting is you had a great model with with um, with Fugazi about keeping the ticket price down and not having shirts and stuff. But being a day and age that a lot of bands are having a hard time to keep control of their merchandise that's not really theirs anymore that other companies are doing it. Are you seeing struggles with non Fugazi stuff or minor threat? Are other shirts and stuff being made that aren't affiliated with you that are people just kind of taking them all running because it's just so hard to track you stuff bootlegs? like that now? Yeah, but a lot of companies are so good at it nowadays. It looks like it's official merchandise. It's not well, like Fugazi, Fugazi never made shirts. Right. So that's, it's really, it's a funny thing. Meyer but Threat, as a fan, I know that, but other people don't later on, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm just, let me, ex I'll explain something to you. So yeah. Meyer Threat, those guys actually back in 1983, Lyle and um, Brian, and they made Meyer Threat shirts. So it wasn't like that. We, those guys were selling, I didn't make them, but they did. And, um, and they, and I didn't make any money. That was their gig, not mine. Uh, but um, over the years, there was a few companies that would make shirts and send us a check every now and then. And we were, you know, we were fine with that. And 
but it got confusing because then anybody could do a shirt and then I would get a call from Jeff Nelson and he'd say, this, this is a bootleg. And you know, there's some guys selling bootleg Meyer thread shirts. I'm like, Oh, and then he'd say, I, what do you want me to do? And he's like, well, I guess shut it down because you know, oh, these other people are actually paying us. And, that, and I was like, I don't, first of all, I don't care about shirts. I don't, I never wear band shirt. I just don't care. <laughs> so the idea that I'm spending my time going after bootleg, it just seems so weird. Bootleg t-shirt stuff. So eventually we ended up working with this company who does, they're a merchandise company for the Meyer Threat, just Meyer Threat shirts. And it was such a relief because they have like, that's their, they have the Meyer Threat merch rights. So they're in charge. So then now somebody, there's a bootleg. I say, hey, these guys are doing a bootleg and they deal with it. I don't have to deal with it anymore. It's done. I was talking to this guy and he's a brilliant fellow, this guy who runs this company. And I was talking to him about bootlegging. And he says, there's only really one band that has managed to um, avoid bootlegging on a commercial level. And that's Fugazi because everybody knows that Fugazi doesn't make, does not license their image for t-shirts. So any, like, yeah, somebody can print them up and sell them in their store or whatever. That's fine. Right. But, but I mean, that may happen, but in terms of selling thousands of shirts through some like target or whatever, doing that kind of right. no distributor in the world would take a Fugazi shirt. Cause everybody knows Fugazi doesn't license their stuff. So the, the irony is the one band, that probably has the 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 rich, richest market because there are no shirts is also the band that no one can really bootleg because it's just so well known that we just didn't we don't we don't authorize it. I love it, and, and as a fan, I'm like the fichus I'd love to wear would be a Fugazi, but at the same point, I love the fact you don't have it. Like something yeah, about it just seems your, so cool. It's special. Make your own. Make your own right. shirt. That's what we always tell people: make your own shirts. You know, if you want to write have a name on you, write it yourself. Yeah do it i don't we're fine with that it doesn't matter it's just i think we just wanted to play music and we felt like there was such emphasis on, on merchandise um there was other ways of approaching it. i get it now i understand that things are obviously the world nowadays changed. it's different though it helps the band nowadays sure and it helped bands back then for sure young bands were touring they could sell their shirts it's great no problem but there, the but i actually it is actually a parallel economy I mean, it certainly helps, you know, some of like, you get know, these Uber things. We're talking like, I was talking to someone yesterday, I said, Taylor Swift is selling literally millions of shirts, millions of dollars worth of shirts every night. You know, um, I'm, I'm sure it helps her band or her, you know, but but is it necessary? Probably not. It's just a parallel economy. You know, right. there's always, you know, people always like to set up, you know, the hot dog stand near the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the ballpark. <laughs> It's just, it's just selling. It's just not, you know. That's all. It's just there's t-shirt, there's merch, and then there's music. And nothing wrong with it. Not, not in judgment. If people want to sell or buy it, that's fine. I think for us, just not interesting. We just wanted to play music, and we found a way to do it. Now, people could say, "Yeah, we, you wouldn't be able to do that now." Maybe. I don't know. That I'm not, I don't know. We we're not playing. I'm not playing right now, so I can't really. So it's just it would be a hypothetical. But I will tell you this, I would come up with ways of, I think I could figure out a way to, 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 um, well, it's always about creative response for me. I'm, I, it's a challenge and I like to think of ways to, to defy the convention. Well, I would think with the way social media, the reach now, I think, yeah, you would have had a really good, a new way to approach it because the reach wasn't the same back then. You came up with your own way. Nowadays, you yeah. just got to think about it because the reach is there. What can you do with it? Everything is, the tools are there for anybody now. Right. What they do with it is, you know, if you, everyone's wasting their time with followers, I'll tell you right now. You need to stop worrying about followers and buying followers. That's just ridiculous. They need to fo just, focus on doing stuff. Yeah, I think that in my life, starting as a kid, whenever someone said to me, like, well, you got to do it this way, <laughs> that was always instantly like, oh, I'm going to find another way to do it. You know, just, it's like, I remember everyone saying, well, you got to go to college. I'm like, no, I'm not going to go to college. Like, there's no way. I just felt like I saw colleges. Like I was taking a walk through a parking lot once and then I heard a screeching of a car braking and I thought it was, it was an acoustic illusion. I thought it was right behind me. 
yeah. there was no car. It was screeching somewhere else. I was just lost in a dream and something. Ah, but I, I had that kind of, you know, I froze up getting ready for the impact and it didn't happen. But then I started to think about like, wow, what if I had been killed at that moment? And I was probably, I think I was in 11th grade. And I thought if I had been killed that moment, I would have spent the majority of my sort of cohesive life, you know, in a, my time being bracketed by an institution, school, right? Every day, yeah. five days a week, you're in school. Even the weekends and the summer are defined by school because they're the time off of school. So that's still the, the, the narrative is controlled by the institution. So I was thinking, why on earth would I then volunteer for four more years of that? You know, especially given that my family couldn't pay for college. I have to take out a loan. So if I took out a loan to pay for school, I have to pay back that loan. So when I got out of college, I'd have to get a job. So the institution would continue to find, to define my life. Like you'd go from one school to another school to a job um, where the weekends are real. Like, you know, weekends are, you know, that I had a friend who got a full-time job. She's like, oh, I get it. I understand what the weekend's about now. Um <laughs> I really, I, so for me, I just saw it back then. Like, like, ah, I'm not, yeah, I don't want to submit myself to that. Doesn't, I don't, I think other people have, I'm not talking about other people, it's just me. I said, I just want, I just want to have an empty field. Like, you know, I'll take, I'll do the work and I'll take the responsibility and I, and I'll be, you know, whatever it is. I'll, I won't have, I, I won't have the things other people have. I just want to have my life. That's what I want. I want to own my own time. And that was really clear to me. And it was mostly because people kept saying, like, well, this is what you have to do. And anytime someone said you have to do something, it's worth taking a good look at that and see why you have to do it. What's the find out what the why is, and then you'll usually figure out that you don't have to do it. It's that they didn't ask that question. You know, it's a good point. I think a lot of people don't need college. I think doctors do, but I think a lot of people don't necessarily need to go to school as much as they need to. I encourage them to do this the school. Um, I, I want to thank you today. I, I do. Have, my, my last question is, is, is more of a, a, a casual question is what one what would you say your favorite book is? What one book would you recommend to somebody? You seem like a well-versed person. Like say, hey, you should, this is a good book. You, generally, people should read. Like, what, what would you say is a good? I mean, I can't. I wouldn't have a I don't I'm not a list person. So I don't have I don't know the person, what they're like, what they what they read. I mean, one book they might find I found very interesting as a kid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for instance, I read like I was a huge Kurt Vonnegut fan. Yeah. I read all the Kurt Vonnegut stuff. You know, I found Breakfast of Champions especially to be pretty pretty profound for me, um, just in a way of approaching things. But a book that I thought was really <clears throat> there's a book called Ringo Levio by a guy named Emmett Grogan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, Emmett Grogan was a member of the Diggers. And the Diggers were a, a, a an activist group from the 60s that were involved with the idea of, they're the ones who came up with the phrase, you can't steal it if it's free. They were interested in making free food and free furniture and free things for people. They were, it was like a part of the, you know, the, the, um, 60s kind of underground revolutionary yeah. underground stuff and it's not a perfect book but it's pretty goddamn interesting and it talks about him growing up in new york and then what they because the difference the diggers as i understand it this is my grasp on that is that most of us have heard the yippies you know abby hoffman and jerry rubin people in that right. era but part of it you heard of it because they were actually a that was it they, they were a promotional that's what they were doing. They were like, they were promotional. They were getting, they were advertising something. They were right. being sensationalists and they did a lot of theater to, to get people's attention. They tried to, you know, they're going to levitate, levitate the Pentagon or, or you know, they did a, an action once where they went to the, there's a balcony over the stock market and they threw dollar bills into the stock market and the, and the traders all started to wrestle with each other, you know, so they did some really, you know, they ran a pig for president during the 68 election. The, the, they were very theatrical and that, the, and, and, and as a result, they got a lot of press attention and then, then they've secured their place in history. The diggers, however, were doing the work. 
And you don't hear about them as much because mm-hmm. it, the press didn't write about them as much because it wasn't as sensational. Um, if we only drink from the soda fountain, we just get sugar. But if you go to the spring, you might find something nutritious and life affirming. That is perfect. I, I, we'll end on that note because that's that's a great thing to say. I want to thank you. I mean, I love new books from different people. It's, it's, it's a different way of thinking. I like to somewhere I wouldn't normally go. It's, it's you know even your emails are nice. I just want to tell people even your emails when you write back. It's just you write nice email too. It's like <laughs> people. I, I, I'm sure mine were like horrible, and, but but yours are like nicely written, and it just feels like it's nice. You know, very gentle and and just kind of calm the way you are. I was like, even his emails seem calm and relaxing. It just blows me away. So, trying to you know, do well that, and be well. That's you it. Do, you be kind. And, and everybody, you know, maybe I'm going to take it. The world's not on fire. We just need to be kind. I'm going to take that from that. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. That, and I hope everybody gets a kick out of this. I do too. Thank you very much. Right. Nice to take talk care. to you. Bye bye. Thank Later. you.